if at the end of the day you want a vibrant countryside with vibrant amount of habitat and, and, and species living in it, it is our method which is, which is clearly the most successful, where all the vulnerable species are, are protected and where the vulnerable species uh, nest. It seems with the rest of the country, where the shooting method is not put in to the conservation, that they're, they're, they're struggling. Jimmy Shuttlewood has been a gamekeeper for more than 30 years. Since he was a child, he's been taught good traditions and techniques passed down through generations that keep the countryside alive. So he wasn't prepared for a Channel 4 news reporter who knows little about moor management to question his knowledge in a story which claimed that muir burn or heather burning is bad for the environment. After Jimmy proves to Jane Dodge that peat stays damp and undamaged after the heather above it is burned, she suggests his experience of muir burn can't be trusted because of a criminal conviction 13 years ago for allowing his underkeepers to use illegal traps. At the height of the raptor persecution scandal in the early 2000s, police caught Jimmy's underkeepers using cage traps baited with live doves. Everybody's entitled to freedom of speech, so um, obviously anyone can ask me whatever ever, 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 ever they want to ask me. But I'm, I'm very confident in the view that what we're doing is very right. Some great big issues are being made about the way that the, uh, the country people are looking after the countryside, whether you're a farmer, whether you're shooting. Uh, in the fact, there's not many professions now which are truly, where you're truly a man of the earth, you know, where, you, where you're truly in connection with the ground and the surroundings and the woods and so on. So there's very, very, very few um, professions. So we get challenged. The hypocrisy in Jane Dodge's dodgy reporting, which includes getting Jimmy's name wrong, is that Channel 4 News trusts claims made by animal rights extremist Luke Steele over Jimmy. In an anti-shooting report two weeks earlier, a Channel 4 News reporter doorstepped a grouse shoot in an attempt to get shoot staff to incriminate themselves over trapping birds of prey. Steele has four convictions, including intimidation of persons, and has spent 182 days in prison. That's 182 more than Jimmy. Instead of trying to discredit Steele, Channel 4 chief correspondent Alex Thompson may have committed contempt of court by declaring in his report that a local gamekeeper is guilty of killing a goshawk before a trial had even begun. Thompson bases his assertions on this video provided by Steele from possibly illegally placed trail cams. Strict liability contempt is supposed to prevent the media from publishing sensationalist material about a criminal case until the trial is over and the jury has given its verdict. Thompson and Channel 4 News appear to break those rules with their report, which can still be seen on YouTube. Anything can be twisted with a little bit of film cut, a little bit of someone saying something. I didn't see anything getting killed in that film. What I can see was that something was put in a bag and perhaps taken away. But the rest of it is, 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 all, is all assumption. Is Channel 4 taking part in another crime of hate speech against a minority? It seems to be uh, an open season on gamekeepers and country people. It seems that you can say what you want, you can offend, you can be prejudiced, you can bully, you can, you, you can say whatever you want and, and that's perfectly all right. Well, I cannot say how that is acceptable if other, if other minorities were treated in the same way are viewed upon that we are, there would be hell to pay. I mean, if the RSPB and other, other charities keep saying that gamekeepers are persecuting birds of prey, well then everybody's going to believe that every gamekeeper kills, kills birds of prey. The RSPB says it wants heather burning banned and is leading a high profile campaign that involves politicians and activists. So it seems odd that at the same time it's advertising a job in the Cairngorms that involves muir burn and deer culling. The consequences of not controlling the heather with burning had a devastating effect on the moor decades ago. This particular part of the moor that we're on um, caught fire in the 1950s. It burned over 2,000 acres and it was in a, in a time of year when it was uh, dry and hot and windy and it it took several, several weeks to get under control. Bulldozers were brought in to bulldoze the peat down to the bedrock because it was a peat now that, that was a light. And we lost three feet of peat 
the sheep had to be taken off the moor, there was no more sheep in the area, there was no grouse, no grouse shooting, and the ash was knee deep. Now as we're driving along we're seeing these bits of stones, and these are the remnants of a, of a Bronze Age village which, which came, which, which was unveiled by the peat being destroyed by the fire. The lessons we learned in the 1950s on this ground was not to let the heather get long. It took 20 years until you could put any sheep back out on the hill, until the grouse started to peer and they all followed the growth of the heather. So the heather had to regenerate from ground zero, literally. If we banned heather burning, what do we, what do we have? The, the first thing, the first thing is, is summer fires, these wildfires. And guess what? These have happened on the RSPB reserves. The RSPB have not managed to conserve their peat. They've, they haven't managed their mower. They've, they've left the heather long, which means this, is, this, is, this, this, this makes the peat extremely vulnerable. The RSPB's annual report also claims heather burning causes flooding, which Jimmy dismisses with basic physics and biology. What I've noticed in my experience, what causes flooding is an awful lot of rain. And when we see the, where we see these floods are, where we see these floods are, there's been four, five, six inches of rain falling. The heather doesn't actually absorb water. So whether it's there or it's not, the water still falls off the heather pretty immediately onto the peat. It's been raining today um, and the peat does absorb a certain amount of water, but it doesn't absorb it quickly. So we've got a puddle here that's just, just been formed. This, is, this isn't formed for any reason then the dry heath is compacted and doesn't particularly soak up water like, like blanket bog does. So the idea of, of, of peat soaking up water, it does slowly, but when you get a lot of rain quickly, it sim simply bounces off and runs, runs downhill. Revive, a group that promotes rewilding, claims grouse moors can become wooded wonderlands teeming with wildlife. It ignores the huge conservation benefits that grouse moors already provide, and the fire risks of acre after windblown acre of scrub woodland. I, th I think the actual operation of planting trees, you would have to plough up the peat, you would have to disturb the peat, you would release the carbon dioxide from that. And you would have no more heather and you'd lose the habitat from those species which have evolved over the, the 7,000 years, which I'm told is the history, which, 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 which is the natural history of this area. We no longer any, any, any sustainable population of, of red grouse, be no nesting for curlews, no, no habitat for the golden plover, no habitat for the, for, for the lapwing. So our country, United Kingdom, will be less diverse without our unique moorland that we have it. There's nowhere quite in the world that has the moorland like we have it here. Jimmy is concerned about the future, but for a different reason, the lack of skilled people to carry on his centuries old trade. If it is very difficult employing people that you don't have to train from scratch. So I was trained by my elders. Some, some are dead now, quite a lot are dead now. Um, and I'm always learning different things all the time. I've got to adapt. Everything's an effort. Everything is a huge effort. So the, the, the children that are reared here uh, see a nice shiny uh, easy, easy way of living outside world and, and quite often get pulled out. And then the people that have had the easy living, which have seen the romantic side of living in the countryside, come and try it. And some actually are quite natural and, and take to it really well. And that's the winning space for, for those people. I think that sign's probably from the 650s and 60s. Um, people were more in touch with the countryside, more in touch with what can go wrong just uh, kind of makes me think what people have forgotten from the lessons we've learnt in the past.